Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. He is famous for the art of the deal. Now President Trump is trying out that negotiating savvy with members of Congress over immigration reform. Today, the president put Democrats on the spot and on camera, challenging them to work with Republicans ahead of another potential government shutdown next week. But his 55-minute on-cam negotiation, where he appeared to control the room, also appears to be giving hardline immigration conservatives a lot of heartburn tonight. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts shows us what happened today. Good evening, John. Brett, good evening to you. It's something that we've never seen before. Typically, the press pool goes into a presidential event for a few minutes just at the top to hear a couple of perfunctory statements. But today, the pool stayed for nearly an hour and watched almost an entire meeting. My positions are going to be what the people in this room come up with. With the clock running on a March 5th deadline to find a legislative solution on the so-called dreamers, President Trump brought Republicans and Democrats together at the White House with the cameras rolling. I feel having the Democrats in with us is absolutely vital because this should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. It started with public statements tailored for TV coverage, but over time, the lenses appeared to fade into the background, and lawmakers got down to some real position setting and negotiation. Senator Lindsey Graham suggesting a DACA fix could be the opening bid for another stab at comprehensive immigration reform. I'm not going to support a bill if you don't support it. If we do this properly, DACA. You're not so far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you want to take it that further step, I'll take the heat. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take all the heat you want to give me. And I'll take the heat off both the Democrats and the Republicans. My whole life has been heat. <laughs> I like heat in a certain way. With all due respect, Bob and uh, Mike uh, and Lindsey, uh, there are some things that you're proposing that are going to be very controversial and will be an impediment to agreement. But you're going to negotiate those things. You're going to sit down. You're going to say, "Listen, we can't agree here. We, we'll give you half of that." We're going to. You're going to negotiate Mr. those President, things. Comprehensive you're, means comprehensive. No. The president went into the meeting demanding security provisions, a wall, an end to chain migration, ending the visa lottery, and more ICE agents in return for a DACA fix. At one point, Senator Dianne Feinstein said the process needs to be split up, leave border security for later. What about a clean DACA bill now and with a commitment that we go into a comprehensive immigration reform procedure? The president seemed to entertain the idea. I have no problem. I, I think that's basically what Dick is saying. But House Majority Leader. Leader Kevin McCarthy jumped in to say, hold on a minute. We don't want to be back here two years later. You have to have security. White House officials say that after the cameras left, the president reached agreement with the two sides to do immigration in two phases. The first, DACA, including border security and end to chain migration and the visa lottery. Then second, comprehensive immigration reform. Democrats indicated they'll give it a shot. I think the president actually wants to strike a deal. Now, whether that deal is strikeable is another question, but I think it's possible. Letting the cameras stay for most of the meeting appeared to serve two purposes. After charges in the new book, Fire and Fury, that he was mentally incapable of being president, the exercise showed President Trump in command of a meeting with 22 lawmakers. And there was the rare glimpse behind the curtain of how the legislative sausage is made. A number of individuals in the room felt it was a good thing to let you see the cooperation uh, and the conversation between uh, both sides and see how we're working and leading to move the ball down the field and come up with some real solutions. Just how much cooperation there will be in the negotiation seems to be an open question. After he got out of the meeting, the House Minority Whip Steny Hoyer said that, yes, there was unanimity in the room about the need to address the issue of the dreamers. But Brett, he wouldn't go beyond that. John Roberts live in the North Lawn. John, thanks. Much more on this with the panel. We learned late this afternoon, former White House Chief Strategist Steve Bannon has stepped down from Breitbart News Network. A stunning fall from political grace. This comes just days after a public break with his old boss, President Trump. Bannon had been executive chairman of Breitbart since 2012. A lawyer for the founder of Fusion GPS opposition research firm says someone has been killed because of the pub publication of that Trump dossier. The revelation comes in a transcript of Glenn Simpson's testimony before Congress that also suggests the government had a source inside the Trump campaign. The transcript coming out today without the blessing 
of the chairman. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harrod straightens things out for us tonight. Good evening, Catherine. Well, thank you, Red. According to the transcript, Simpson told Senate investigators former British spy Christopher Steele went to the FBI in July 2016, the same month the Bureau opened its Russia investigation, and again in September 2016 because Steele feared candidate Trump could be blackmailed. Simpson said Steele went further, claiming the FBI had a human source to corroborate. They, the FBI, believed Chris's information might be credible because they had other intelligence that indicated the same thing. And one of those pieces of intelligence was a human source from inside the Trump organization. But this was disputed by sources close to Simpson once the transcript was public, who told the Washington Post and NBC News the reference was to intelligence provided by the Australian ambassador about a Trump campaign aide, George Papadopoulos. Simpson's attorney, Joshua Levy, did not respond to Fox's request for further clarification. In the transcript, the same lawyer claimed an individual was dead after the dossier was published a year ago this month. He, Simpson, wants to be very careful to protect his sources, Levy said. Somebody's already been killed as a result of the publication of this this dossier and no harm should come to anybody related to this honest work. Simpson told Senate investigators that Steele cut off contact with the FBI in late October 2016 after then FBI Director James Comey notified Congress that he was reopening the Clinton email case and a media report that the FBI had found no connections to Russia. Chris severed his relationship with the FBI out of concern that he didn't know what was happening inside the FBI and there was a concern that the FBI was being manipulated for political ends by the Trump people. The transcript was released today unilaterally by the Senate Judiciary Committee's ranking Democrat Dianne Feinstein, who said innuendo and misinformation about the transcript undermined the investigation. The committee's Republican Chairman Chuck Grassley called the decision confounding because the investigation is ongoing and Feinstein's actions undermine the integrity of the committee and jeopardize its ability to secure candid voluntary testimony in the future. And as Fox News first reported in November, Simpson met with the Russian lawyer Natalia Veselnitskaya before and after the June 2016 Trump Tower meeting, but Simpson insisted he knew nothing about it, Brett. Catherine, late today, the president released a memorandum uh, taking on the so-called unmasking issue. Well, that's right. According to the mem memorandum, the nation's intelligence chief, the director of national intelligence, Dan Coats, has 30 days to lay out the framework for unmasking. This is the identification of U.S. persons in foreign intelligence reports. These procedures will be followed by the intelligence community in the future when they receive requests from government officials to identify American citizens. The chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Devin Nunez, recently told Fox News his investigators had already found evidence the surveillance system was abused under the previous administration, Brett. Okay, we'll follow it all. Catherine, thanks. You're welcome. House Majority Whip Steve Scalise says he will undergo surgery tomorrow as part of his recovery from gunshot wounds sustained in last summer's shooting at a congressional baseball practice. Scalise says he has already made tremendous progress from injuries suffered when he was struck by a bullet in the hip, which shattered bones and damaged internal organs. Earmarks. Mechanisms used by congressional lawmakers to pay for a project, usually to benefit his or her constituents, well, they have evolved from a way of doing business to really a dirty word. But that may be changing for better or worse, depending on your point of view. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is on Capitol Hill tonight. I hear so much about earmarks, the old earmark system. Maybe all of you should start thinking about going back to a form of earmarks. An earmark is defined as specific money designated for a specific project at a specific place by a specific lawmaker. I've been here, everybody. The House Rules Committee is expected to announce hearings in the coming days to look um, no, at the pros and cons of bringing them back. We've encouraged our members all along uh, to, to talk about budget process reforms. Um, many of us have opinions on this issue, but I want our members to have conversations. What we're asking for is a chance to vet ideas and to take the things that we think that are best and make a recommendation to the Republican conference. I stand opposed to this legislation because spreading pork around to secure enough votes to pass this turkey is wrong. John Boehner led a crusade against earmarks during his time in Congress. When Boehner was about to become speaker, he declared war on them. I told my constituents in 1990 when they elected me that if they thought my job was to come to Washington and rob the public treasury on their behalf, they are voting for the wrong guy. The so-called bridge to nowhere in Alaska, price tag $320 million, became a symbol of fiscal irresponsibility in Congress. It made the term earmark toxic with the American people, and some mocked their colleagues for wanting to bring home the bacon for their constituents. There are certain people who have grown up on pork 
Uh, they oink whenever they go back to the, the district and they talk about what they've done. Supporters of the pet project say it would be better for elected lawmakers in Congress to hold the power of the purse rather than unelected bureaucrats making spending decisions. And with President Trump and congressional leaders looking at an infrastructure package this year, some appropriators suggest a limited return. My proposal is to make sure these projects come from state or local government. They're done at subcommittee with the member's name attached that does not increase spending and goes to the entire legislative process out in the sunshine. Critics suggest that would be a slippery slope, but clearly the president thinks that is a way to make the environment here on Capitol Hill less toxic. Brett? Mike Emanuel, live on the Hill. Mike, thanks. Another big day for stocks with records across the board. The Dow surged 103 points. The S&P 500 and the Nasdaq hit new record closes for the sixth day in a row. The S&P 500 gained four. The Nasdaq was up six. Let's talk more about the U.S. economy and the outlook for business in 2018. Tom Donahue is the president and CEO of U.S. Chamber of Commerce. He will deliver his annual State of American Business address tomorrow. Tom, thanks for being here. I'm glad to be back. What is the state of American business tonight? Uh, it's a lot better than it was a year ago when we talked about this. <clears throat> we have had two quarters of uh, more than 3% growth. That, in my opinion, was based on some confidence that the tax uh, bill was moving forward and a review of the extraordinary improvement that we've made in uh, reducing some of the explosion of regulation on American business during the last uh, administration. I think we're getting more of a balance. I think we have a positive look forward. Now what we have to do is to make sure we don't louse it up. You know that the criticism of the tax bill, now law, was that businesses would take that money and pocket it for their, their company, their investors. Uh, we're seeing a number of companies putting it back into the company or giving checks out to workers. What's your assessment of where things stand? Well, I think at first it's important to understand this is not the government's money. This is the people's money that they share with the government as a way of having a positive experience and support from our central and state governments. Once you think about that, then you can make, I think, much better judgments on how you're going to go about tax reform to achieve your objective, which is getting well over 3% and keeping it there for a long period of time. We've been almost 10 years with, with below, uh, for, never had it that long in our history, and being below 2%. We have got to do this. So what do we do in a tax bill? We said we're going to lower corporate taxes. We said that we were going to stop letting American companies be double taxed if they did business offshore and onshore. That's twice. So what do they do? They left it overseas. We said we're going to have expensing uh, in capital expenditures that you could deduct right away. And they said we're going to do things to help the middle class. We got that done. Now there are odds and ends in the bill that we're still going to deal with the transition arrangements and get some of those fixed. But the bottom line to remember, A, it's the people's money, it's not the government's money. B, that what we're doing is we're making investments by putting a, a bill in place that are going to drive economic growth, that are going to put cash in the pockets of the people that invent and create, promote and employ. And we're very optimistic that this is going to help. But by the way, we only did it a week and a half ago. We still have to do all the transition rules. Uh, stay tuned and we'll get this done. If you're going to measure it today, you're not being fair. As a matter of fact, a lot of the people that were criticizing start with, oh, it'll never pass. It won't be fair. It's not going to work. What we've learned so far, that's all wrong. There's a whole list of issues that you bring up. Edu Education, the workforce, infrastructure, and you're hopeful about that. Trade, the chamber has its own thoughts that, that sometimes differ with the administration. Always. But here is <laughs> where the president is on immigration today. Take a listen. When this group comes back, hopefully with an agreement, this group and others from the Senate, from the House, comes back with an agreement, I'm signing it. I mean, I will be signing it. I'm not going to say, oh, gee, I want this or I want that. I'll be signing it because I have a lot of confidence in the people in this room that you're going to come up with something really good. 
What did you think of that 55-minute open negotiation today? I thought it made the president look a lot stronger than some people in the press had. I thought that it was great to see our friends in both parties in there debating with him and among themselves. And I think it led to some conversation that has some potential. I was a party of the group that a few years ago uh, got in the Senate uh, a, a comprehensive immigration bill. It needed improvement, but it never got past that. Uh, the bottom line is that you have got to realize that we don't have enough people in this country to do what this country, if we did an immigration, I mean, excuse me, an, an infrastructure bill today, the size that everybody's talking about, you couldn't do it because we wouldn't have the workers. We are getting lower in unemployment. There are still some people frozen in places around the country they can't move. But we're going to need people to work at every level in this country. The technological people that we educate in our best universities, if we send them home, we're going to have to send the work with them. The people that we need for seasonal work, people generally agree about that. The people that we need for special issues, for example, our biggest problem right now in people we need in this country is what are we going to do about caring for the elderly? More and more of them living longer and longer. I think the president has started a great conversation. I know there are people in both parties that want to deal with this. We're going to be a part of it. It's a controversial thing, especially in, in the Republican Party. Uh, as you know, we've been down this road before, uh, but you're confident. I'm confident we'll have a good debate, and I'm confident that one time we're going to move on it because when you run out of people, you run out of, you know, it only takes two people, Brent, two things to drive economics. One is money, and we've got a lot of that, and now more because of tax reform, and two is people, and if you don't have the quality people, you don't put it together. Tom Donahue. CEO of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, State of the American Business tomorrow. We appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Look forward to come back soon. All right. Thank you. Can sports accomplish what diplomacy and military threats have not? North and South Korea agree on the Olympics. That's next. A bit of a thaw tonight in the extremely frigid relations between the two Koreas. North Korea has agreed to send a delegation to next month's Olympic Games in South Korea. Senior Foreign Affairs Correspondent Greg Palcott in Seoul tonight tells us what else came from today's historic talks. Breaking the ice in Panmunjom. Delegations from North and South Korea meeting for the first time in two years along the DMZ. The relations between the two Koreas are frozen up more than this winter's weather. After 11 hours of talks, they accomplished their main goal. North Korea will send athletes, officials and others to South Korea's Winter Olympics next month, a big priority for the South. North Korea's participation in Pyeongchang's Winter Olympics is needed to promote Peace Olympics. Also approved other measures to improve relations between the regime of Kim Jong-un and South Korea, including military talks to reduce tensions along the border. South Korea agreed to resolve problems through dialogue and consultation. But some topics were off limits. South Korea raised North Korea's nukes. It was quickly rejected, even if the U.S., not the South, would be targeted. Regarding the nuclear issues, our strategic weapons, including atomic bombs, hydrogen bombs, and intercontinental missiles, are only aimed at the United States, not our brethren. The Trump administration promoted the talks and even facilitated them by delaying military exercises until after the Olympics. But the U.S. could find itself pitted against ally South Korea. The maximum pressure U.S. wanted to put on the regime could be minimized. It looks like North Korea, to me, have got the slightly upper hand. Uh, this is a very easy way for them to, uh, on the surface, relieve a lot of pressure, uh, especially that diplomatic isolation that the Trump administration have been pushing for so much. Still, the State Department is putting a brave face on things, claiming that the United States remains in close consultations with South Korean officials, who will ensure North Korean participation in the Winter Olympics does not violate the sanctions imposed by the UN Security Council. For South Korea, the next few months, at the very least, might be a welcome pause in hostilities and threats.
The State Department also confirming that the U.S. will be sending a high-level delegation to the Olympics here in South Korea, and that could include Vice President Pence. No word on whether they will be rooting for the North. Brett. Greg Palcott, live in Seoul early Wednesday morning. Greg, thanks. It is the mystery in Havana. And tonight, lawmakers are trying to get to the bottom of what really happened to American diplomats in Cuba who ended up with serious medical conditions. Correspondent Rich Edson has the latest tonight from the State Department. Months of investigation, multiple trips to Cuba, and the State Department says it still cannot explain what's caused these symptoms. Sharp localized ear pain, dull unilateral headache, tinnitus or ringing in one ear, Vertigo. The United States says 24 Americans are experiencing this. They worked at the embassy in Havana. The State Department says it has no evidence of attacks after August 21st. This morning, frustrated senators called State Department officials to explain their incomplete findings. A preliminary report from the FBI says it has uncovered no evidence sound waves are responsible in these so-called sonic attacks. In October, the Associated Press reported some diplomats heard this sound. Though investigators said they're unsure that sound itself was harmful or a byproduct of something else. The State Department claims, and Cuba denies, the Cuban government knows what's hurting these diplomats. There are 24 Americans who either work for the U.S. government who during their time in Havana have experienced symptoms that are consistent with what you would see in mild traumatic brain injury and or concussion. Rubio and other Republicans said in September the U.S. should close its embassy in Havana if Cuba failed to take tangible action. The U.S. removed much of its staff from Havana and has expelled more than a dozen Cuban diplomats from Washington. Senators supporting better relations with Cuba stress there's no evidence the Cuban government attacked American diplomats. We're in a very important time here in Cuba. Other uh, countries are beefing up their diplomatic presence here and we're scaling back. Um, that's not good for us. The State Department says it has established an official accountability review board to investigate its security on this issue. Senator Rubio says state violated the law in waiting so long to do so. Brett. Rich Edson at the State Department. Rich, thanks. Up next, he says he was fired by Google for being a conservative white male. Now he's taking the tech giant to court. First, beyond our borders tonight, a train collision on the outskirts of Johannesburg, South Africa, has left more than 200 people injured. No fatalities reported yet. It's the second crash in that area in several days. Last week, at least 18 people died and 260 were injured in a more serious accident. A reformist lawmaker in Iran says 3,700 people were arrested during widespread pr protests and unrest over the past two weeks. That is a far higher number than authorities in Iran previously reported. At least 21 people were reportedly killed. Rescuers have found a body believed to be of a sailor from an Iranian oil tanker that collided with a freighter registered in Hong Kong. 31 more people are missing from that Iranian ship. It's still on fire and there are environmental concerns about the nearly one million barrels of oil it was carrying. Just some of the other stories beyond our borders tonight. We'll be right back. If you type in conservative and discrimination into your Google search engine right now, the first story that might pop up will be about our next story. A former Google employee claims he was fired because of his conservative beliefs and the fact that he's white. National correspondent William Lajeunesse tells us tonight from Los Angeles, now that man is taking Google to court. Then they said, you know, you're terminated for perpetuating gender stereotypes. In August, Google fired James Damore after he said, while trying to promote diversity, Google discriminated against white men. They felt it was a challenge to the orthodoxy and it needed to be silenced. Damore's memo, which went viral, suggested biology, not bigotry, accounted for gender inequity in tech. People at Google are trying very hard to 
diversify the company, make it more welcoming to women and minorities, and so a memo like James did not go over well. You're a misogynist and a terrible human, said one coworker. I will keep hounding you until one of us is fired. Expletive you. Another said, if Google management cares enough about diversity and inclusion, they should send a clear message by not only terminating Mr. Damore, but also severely disciplining or terminating those who have expressed support. Jobs are being reserved at Google for minorities and women. That's illegal under California and federal employment laws. Labor Department figures show 69% of Google employees are male, 56% white. It's okay to disparage, smear, belittle, bully, discriminate conservatives and white men. That's not acceptable. Filed as a class action, the suit claims liberal, politically correct attitudes at Google and throughout Silicon Valley silence conservative thought. I found that to be an increasing complaint in Silicon Valley, especially after the presidential election. I mean, companies like Google and Facebook have historically had a really cozy relationship with the Democrats. They were very much caught off guard by the election. Google said it fired Damore because he perpetuated a gender stereotype, and the company looks forward to defending itself in court. Brett? William, thank you. A huge mystery tonight involving a secret U.S. government satellite. Not so secret anymore. It was supposed to be launched into orbit Sunday by the private firm SpaceX. But right now, no one is saying what really happened once the rocket got off the ground. Correspondent Phil Keating is on the case tonight from Miami. Four. Three, two, one. Ignition, liftoff. What looked like a spectacular nighttime start to a classified government mission ends up in a multi billion dollar mystery and disaster. For a full day, people around the world thought the top secret Zuma payload, presumably a military or spy satellite, was in low Earth orbit. As a standard procedure for classified payloads, customer Northrop Grumman requested SpaceX's live feed be stopped after the first stage rocket separated and then successfully landed upright back at Cape Canaveral. It's now believed the satellite failed to separate from the second stage rocket, and Zuma likely plummeted back to Earth. SpaceX built the rocket carrying the classified payload. The company said Tuesday, for clarity, after a review of all data to date, Falcon 9 did everything correctly on Sunday night, opening up the possibility that maybe the satellite itself was flawed. 16 months ago, Facebook's $200 million internet satellite went up in flames atop a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket on the launch pad. SpaceX is cleared for national security missions, recently launching the Air Force's X-37B secretive shuttle-like ship. And SpaceX says everything else on deck is still a go, including the globally hyped demo flight of its Falcon Heavy, twice as powerful as any other rocket on the planet. The equivalent of 18 747s all bolted together together, igniting it once. That launch, scheduled for later this month, is the rocket SpaceX intends to take people to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. Brett. Phil Keating in Miami. Phil, thanks. Up next, the All-Star panel joins me to break down the latest on the immigration debate, debate and today's rare meeting. First, what some of our other Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. WWOR in New Jersey as Governor Chris Christie delivers his final State of the State address. Christie leaves office after two terms with low approval numbers after his failed presidential run and the so-called Bridgegate scandal. Fox 11 in Los Angeles where at least eight people were killed when heavy rain sent a wall of mud sliding down hills in Southern California. Those hills had been stripped of vegetation by a gigantic wildfire that raged in that area last month. Rescue crews are using helicopters to lift people to safety because of blocked roads and waist-high mud. And this is a live look from Phoenix, from our, from our affiliate Fox 10. One of the big stories there tonight, former Maricopa County Sheriff Joe Arpaio announces a run for the U.S. Senate. Arpaio was recently pardoned by President Trump after a conviction of criminal contempt of court. Arpaio and others are seeking the seat being vacated by Republican incumbent Jeff Flake, who said today Arpaio's Senate bid is doomed. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back.
62% of the Trump voters support a pathway to citizenship for the DACA kids if you have strong borders. You have created a opportunity here, Mr. President, and you need to close the deal. We can agree on some very fundamental and important things together on border security, on chain, uh, on the future of diversity visas. Comprehensive, though, I worked on it for six months. We don't have six months for the DACA. We're not talking about it. If we do this properly, DACA, you're not so far away from comprehensive immigration reform. And if you want to take it that further step, I'll take the heat. I don't care. I don't care. I'll take all the heat you want to give me. And I'll take the heat off both the Democrats and the Republicans. My whole life has been heat. <laughs> It was an extraordinary meeting today at the White House. President Trump meeting with uh, members of the Senate and the House, both parties, saying the press may want to stick around. And we did. And we sat and saw and broadcast uh, this negotiation ongoing about immigration priorities primarily. President Trump uh, and lawmakers wanting to get to four high priority areas, border security, chain migration, visa lottery system, and DACA policy, a lot of back and forth. And you can imagine immigration conservatives not too happy about it. And Coulter tweeting out, Trump flanked by Dems and open border GOPs announced his plan for 100% open-ended amnesty per courts. But don't worry, there will be border security Security, political euphemism for you're not getting the wall. Uh, with that, let's bring in our panel. Jonathan Swan, national political reporter for Axios. Julie Pace, Washington Bureau Chief for Associated Press. And Katie Pavlich, news editor at townhall.com. Uh, Julie, it was quite something. 55-minute pool spray. That's pretty rare at the it White House, and rare. it's a lot easier to do the reporting when you actually get to sit in the room and hear the negotiations. As we're opposed all for to, it, by the we way. We love it. I think it's great. I take, I would take more of these kind of pool sprays. It was a fascinating discussion because you actually do see that on immigration, which is this really sensitive, very emotional topic, there actually are the broad outlines of an agreement. There actually have been for years, but it's when you get beyond these top line talking points, border security. To Democrats and Republicans, border security can mean very different things. When you talk about comprehensive immigration reform, when you start talking about whether that would mean citizenship or legal status for people. So the president is not wrong when he says that he could see the outlines of a deal here, but getting to, through the details of this, both on a potential short-term package that could address DACA and border security, and then certainly on a longer-term comprehensive immigration package, there is a lot to work through here. Sure, so. but Jonathan, he said, whatever you all come up with, I am going to sign even if I don't totally agree with it. Right, but the Republican leaders are still paralyzed with fear of alienating the base and alienating members who don't want to give amnesty without really big concessions in terms of a wall. And frankly, you see in that meeting, Julie's exactly right, the definition of what a clean bill is came up. Trump goes, oh, yeah, no, I like a clean bill. But then it turns out, in Trump's mind, a clean bill is DACA plus a wall. Sure. And look, where this is heading, well, like it or not, unless some dynamic really changes, it's quite likely we get a government shutdown. There are huge... Or another punt. Another or another punt. punt but, but you know what? They may not get the votes for a short-term CR because there's a lot of these defense hawks, uh, Republicans, who aren't willing to go again and kick the can down the road because Ryan gave away the farm last time. So it's actually not going to be that easy to get a short-term CR. Well, I mean, we've seen this, this story before in Washington about conservatives concerned about immigration policy. But let me just rewind and just the, the atmospherics of that moment. After three days of this wolf book about mental capacity and how the president is essentially babbling, um, he kind of held court there today. It definitely gave the White House an opportunity to take back the narrative, to get away from the drama that that book presented uh, on the national stage. It allowed the president to do a number of things. It allowed everyone across the country to see that he was in control, uh, asking Republicans and Democrats to come to the table with good ideas that they can agree on, but in a civil manner. It also allowed him to put members of Congress on the record in their own words about what their ideas were, to present them directly to the American people. And on the issue of DACA and getting a deal, the thing is, is that DACA is not just about DACA. It includes comprehensive immigration reform in terms of all the DACA recipients in this country have parents, 
they have families, the parents that brought them here are illegal immigrants, so they are very directly connected. So you actually can't do DACA without addressing comprehensive immigration or reform, chain migration which is very and difficult. Right. Lottery system and everything else. But you think the lawmakers in that room, Julie, were surprised that the cameras were still there? <laughs> I think like, they were awfully are they surprised. Still here? I mean, just for, for people who who aren't in the White House every day, you know, you have to explain how rare this is. We often come in, the press comes in, and we see the top of a meeting where maybe the president maybe one or two congressional leaders will make statements that frankly don't have much news in them and then the real negotiations happen behind the scenes so to see this play out uh, in real time to to see Kevin McCarthy interrupting the president <laughs> to talk about a clean bill to see the back and forth between the Republicans and the Democrats it's great fun it's pretty extraordinary So on the day that some conservatives are concerned about his positions and what he said in that meeting about immigration and on a day where the White House said the president's going to Davos mm -hmm. Switzerland mm -hmm. Uh, we get word that Steve Bannon is stepping down from the Breitbart News Network, um, saying Steve is a valued part of our legacy and we'll always be grateful for his contributions, what he has helped us to accomplish. But this is a pretty stark fall from grace politically uh, for a guy who was at the top of the, the heap. Uh, Trump broke him. Trump made phone calls last week and he told people explicitly uh, you've got a choice now. It used to be you used to choose between Jared Kushner and Steve Bannon. Now you're choosing between me and Steve Bannon. And the White House was keeping score. Who was going out on TV? Who was trashing Bannon? Who was sort of, you know, dilly-dallying around? And Steve Bannon found himself completely isolated. His biggest funders, the Mercers, have backed away from him. And now he's a man who still views himself as a revolutionary, as this great historic figure, but he finds himself without a media vehicle, without a platform, without any major donors funding his political activity, and without any staff. He's a man entirely alone. It's, it's quite remarkable how fast he's fallen. Okay. Just given the way that Steve Bannon swooped into Breitbart years ago when Andrew Breitbart passed away, I am happy to see he is gone, and I hope that Breitbart as a news organization can regain what Andrew Breitbart decided to start there because his name certainly deserves better. I left off of the list of the immigration concerns, Davos, and bringing up earmarks. Yes. Yes. That too. I mean, uh, all on the same day. Uh, to bring back earmarks really rattled a lot of conservatives to hear the president. I think it was Michael Needham from Heritage who said to hear the president who promised to drain the swamp talk about bringing back earmarks is pretty extraordinary. But this is the other Trump. I mean, this is the president Absolutely. he wants to be, the post-partisan president, bigger than Republican and Democrat, this transcendent figure. You know, this is the guy he wants to and be. the reality of earmarks, yeah. the <laughs> upside of earmarks is it's a heck of a lot easier to make a deal when well, you have that, the earmark right. power. It's, it's all the goodies. Yeah. The Democrat yeah. resistance to Trump from the beginning has been so baffling to me because he has a record of being a Democrat, yep. being an independent who can work with everybody. So I think he proved that today with his meeting on immigration. He's showing that he can moderate on a variety of issues, and he's not this hardcore right winger. He that has the no left attachments. Is actually, right, has no the left attachments. has actually uh, painted him out to be. We'll see how hard the hard line immigration conservatives come uh, in and coming Coulter's days it, and so. hours. Next up, has someone actually been killed over the Trump dossier? And the latest about what came out today. It is so bitterly ironic to me that Fusion GPS wanted us to rely on quintuple hearsay from Russian sources that nobody knows. They wanted us to, to base a presidential vote on that, but they went to court to keep us from finding out yeah. who paid them and who they were paying. The House Intelligence Committee has requested documents from you and other government officials from the so-called Steele dossier. Why have you failed to produce these documents? In many instances, we are dealing with very, very dicey questions of sources and methods, which is the lifeblood of foreign intelligence and for our liaison relationships with our foreign partners. The FBI director uh, saying why they were not coming forward with some of these details. Now we have the transcript from Glenn, Glenn Simpson, the head of Fusion GPS, put out by Senator Dianne Feinstein. Uh, in part, uh, it says that he, Glenn Simpson, wants to be very careful to protect his sources. Somebody's already been killed as a result of the publication of this dossier, and no harm should come to anyone, anybody related to this honest work. What does this all have to do with what we're learning from this transcript? Uh, uh, and what it tells us about this investigation. Julie. 
Well, I don't think the, the release of the very lengthy interview that Glenn Simpson did sheds new light on the investigation necessarily. I do think that there were a couple of notable uh, pieces of information from Glenn Simpson's transcripts. One, we don't have an answer to, which is a person was killed, he says, uh, as, as it relates to the publication of the dossier. Certainly, there's going to be some interest in figuring out who that person would be. Uh, two, he does talk in his interview with the Judiciary Committee about knowledge that he has of a person involved in the Trump campaign who corroborated for the FBI some of the information in the dossier. What we've been told is that that is likely George Papadopoulos, who it now has been publicly reported, was having a conversation with an Australian ambassador. Whether that means that Papadopoulos was engaging directly with the FBI, which seemed to be one of the takeaways today, I think is probably an overread Yeah, I think the Washington Post has talked about. to them and they're kind of walking it back. Yeah, it, it, it seems like it's, it's basically Glenn Simpson and putting pieces of information together, having heard that there was a Trump person who was able to corroborate some information, but not necessarily that there was a Trump official who was a mole or a walk-in for the FBI. Uh, Jonathan. We're just in such a um, difficult position as the public, as the American public, to make sense of this, because it is so partisan, it is so political. You have a group, Fusion GPS, funded by the Democratic National Committee and the Clinton campaign, paid to produce dirt on Donald Trump. We don't know who their sources are. We don't know anything about their methods. And now we have a selective leak from the Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee opposed by the Republicans. And so, the Republican uh, referral to the Justice Department of the Clinton. Chris, Chris Steele for uh, lying to the FBI. Yeah. Right. So we have this like this, basically, the two parties are dividing on this investigation. You have the Democrats who are all in, and if, if they flip the House, it'll be impeachment, you know, take it to the bank, they'll move impeachment. Then you have Republicans who really want the Clintons to be more investigated. And so if you're the general public trying to make sense of this, it's very difficult, it actually. Is tough. And so a lot of members of Congress that I've, who I've talked to say, you know, we're going to wait. We're going to wait till Mueller comes out with whatever Mueller comes out with. And the House Intelligence Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, all of the committees that are investigating this are going to have to reconcile their facts with the Mueller investigation. But if you look at the information we got today about them saying, Chris, uh, that, uh, sorry, Simpson saying that there is someone who has been killed as a result of a source being exposed, I have to question that a little bit because you have to remember that the dossier was being